Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start in one minute. So allow a few more people to get here. We have 12. All right, we have just a few seconds. Okay, so um, we have uh, Ron Lucchino here who is going to present a very important uh, uh, program for us. It's called um, Understanding and Responding to Dementia Related Behaviors. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Lucchino. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Let me introduce myself, uh, Dr. Ron Lucchino. I'm an emeritus professor of physiology and former director of the gerontology of College in Upstate New York. I spent 25 to 30 years as director working with communities on developing programs, projects, and research on improving the quality of life for families caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So um, I spent um, 30 years of my life in New York up working with it, with the agencies there. And after retired, I went to Florida and I spent about 14 years in Florida, again, uh, working with Department of Aging and other agencies on Flor on, with Florida. And I chair the governor's uh, uh, policy task force for the legislature. I moved here to New Mexico last year and uh, became involved with the Alzheimer's Association. What we're going to talk about today is basically looking at the later stages of behavior changes in the Alzheimer's individuals and some strategies that we need to, to adopt. Uh, before I get into the PowerPoint, I would like to uh, go over five quick, um, oops, not there, oops. Hang on, okay. I wanna go over five very quick slides to more or less put everything in perspective. The first one is basically the definition of dementia. Dementia is some kind of change in these three areas, uh, memory, cognitive impairment, or changes in personality. There's over 30 some different types of dementia, and a dementia is defined as to which of these three areas changes over time, and it's a chronic de decline. So that's the, that's the definition. So we're gonna be looking at memory, cognitive, and the uh, personality changes, which defines Alzheimer's disease. The actual criteria in behavior, when we see an Alzheimer's person, we're looking at a passive withdrawal or less responsive behavior, easily upset, suspicious and paranoid, and volatile emotions. Now these progress at, uh, as a person's uh, dementia increases. At the very beginning, these behaviors are not noticeable. Mid stages, they are. In the last stages, they can become more, more, uh, acquiring more attention to them, specifically about the easily upset. The cognitive changes basically is memory. This is basically learning new tasks, but the memory that we think associated with Alzheimer's disease is forgetting that you forgot. And higher executive functioning, handling complex skills, tasks, and so on, as you see as in the latter stages, higher executive skills are pretty much gone. Uh, reasoning, reasoning abilities, inability to respond to problems, reduce judgment, like going outside in the middle of winter with just a light jacket on. Uh, so again, reasoning ability, the loss of that increases very much so. Spatial and, and, and orientation ability, again, fight, no, this is basically for, for familiar surroundings, time and location, which also diminishes. And language is the, is the part of the cognitive also becomes limited. So these are the three, three areas, behavior, cognition, and I just talked about behavior, which, we're gonna, which we'll go over shortly. Um, this is important. This is kind of the underlying change that occur in, in, in the intervention. This is a regressive change. When you were born, you continuously add skills all your life. If at the age of 60, you begin to have Alzheimer's disease, 
you begin to lose some of those memories. And basically you lose the first memories first, the, the last memories that you gain are, are the first to be, are first to be uh, lost. Then as, as the disease progresses, you begin to lose more and more of those memories. So basically you go back to the age, maybe 30 or so, that this is where you are in your memory. And if you go back even further, the memory dim diminishes. We're gonna be talking a lot about what we call validation therapy. For Alzheimer's disease, validation therapy is critical and very, very important. Validation therapy means you validate the person in, the in their reality of time. If, they are in their, if they're 30 years of age in their reality, that's where you deal with them, with, with food, memory, conversations, and everything. We'll spend more time in that. This is an area where I really have a lot of frustrations if we don't understand that their reality is different than our reality, and we have to, we have to work in their reality. Again, this is kind of an overview summary. Their world is changing. They experience things through senses, touch, very, very important. Because sound, uh, 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 audio, and visual is becoming very confusing. If you think of the brain as a computer, and if you think of the brain uh, as a 1980 computer, that it takes time to recall because of the circuitry is, is uh, not, not, not fully expanded. And uh, so with the brain, the brain loses those connections. So it takes longer to recall. And sometimes with the auditory and visual senses coming into the brain, the brain cannot process them and you have major confusion going on. That's why touch is very, very important. Impaired in memory uh, increases. That the very beginning, we basically identify Alzheimer's disease as forgetting that they forgot. This doesn't mean, oh, I forgot my keys or I forgot to lock the door or whatever the case. You remembered that you forgot. This is where a person forgets their keys and you say, did you bring your keys? They'll say, what keys? So they, they, don't, they just don't remember. They don't remember how to turn off a stove or they, 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 they just forget. And that is beginning at the very, very beginning of Alzheimer's and it progresses where towards the end of, of the late stages, their memory uh, is pretty much reduced. Uh, they really have very little recall memory. Language also we see is a basic change. Uh, they begin to have words, they begin to identify words, cannot follow sentences, and use inappropriate words in the later part. Incontinent is both fecal and urinary, is very, very much uh, prevalent in this time. Dependence on the caregiver increases. This becomes an issue because the, the balance is how much should we depend upon the caregiver as both taking away the little, the, the little, the, the little of the independence that they may have. And then the physical abilities diminish. They eventually will end up in a fetal, a fetal position, a fetal position that they may not be able to stand, walk, and not, they also may not be able to swallow. So those are the areas we see, and we'll talk a little bit more as we go on. Um, Okay, let me, let me go over to the, the last, last of the preparations. Multiple, multiple losses. These individuals have gone through a lot of loss, not only cognition and memory, but senses and so on. And you have to understand that they're very frightened, that they're losing contact with reality. You have to focus on the physical care of, of these individuals. Are they well fed or as much as possible, making sure they're moved as much, you don't have bed sores. So basically you begin to look at the physical care. And a lot of stages, the emotional life of the person is not really that critical because their emotional life has pretty much diminished. They basically are very quiet. They may express some rage or uh, outbursts due to some changes, which we'll talk about. So those are kind of the preliminaries that I wanted to discuss before I actually get into the PowerPoint. And now we'll get into the PowerPoint. Okay, we're understanding and responding to dementia-related behaviors in the later stages. We're going to identify, we're going to attempt to identify triggers for behaviors associated with dementia. That is a very critical statement because every behavior you see, there's a trigger. It could be a trigger as simple as moving some of the pictures on a dresser that uh, upsets them. Because excuse me, Ron. Yes, Sorry. Um, we're not seeing the slides right now. Oh, you're not? No. Could you go ahead and share the oh, attempt to share the PowerPoint again? Let me go back and share the screens again. 
Okay. Share screen. Nope. Can you see it now? We can we can see you uh, clicking the file, uh, so they should come up as soon as the file opens. Okay. We able to see the other slides. Uh, no, through your preliminary, we didn't know there were slides. Huh. Nothing came up yet? Uh, no, sir. Stand by. Lori. Sorry, Ron, we're getting some tech help, um, but go ahead and keep attempting. Okay, should I, should I keep talking or should I try it again? Go ahead and try the PowerPoint a couple more times. Okay, hang on. Stop screen share. Okay, share, uh, share screen. There we are. And find PowerPoint. Okay, you're you're sharing your screen now, but what we're seeing is um, your folder, and we see the mm -hmm. PowerPoint presentation file. Go ahead and double click on that. Let's see what we got. Okay, it came up on my screen. You have two screens. I have the screen of the PowerPoint and a little screen of me. Okay, so he is sharing um, the second screen. He needs to stop sharing. Oh, I I know. I I need to get yeah. I need to kind. Cancel my audio or my visual. Yeah, there. When he shares his screen, he just needs to pick the correct screen. Because he's got two There you go. The show it now. Hello. I'm sorry, Ron. When you hit slideshow, yeah. um, that will isolate the com uh, complete slide. So you don't see it? Yes, uh, we see it. Um, we're just seeing the, the whole presentation. If you wanted to go slide by slide, go ahead. Yeah, and hit that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Okay. You see it now? You see the second slide? Yes. Okay. All right. So. Um, again, uh, by the, uh, I said before, identifying common triggers for behaviors that there's always something that triggers a behavior. A behavior just does not occur. A change of behavior does not occur out of the blue. It can be as simple as I said before, changing the uh, pictures on the dresser or trying to explain something to them that is confused and therefore they'll, they'll, they'll become outraged and become a behavioral change. Okay, also, uh, this, this is also today, explain the process of assessing and identifying the challenging behaviors. That's basically looking at, looking at interventions. Detect and connect. Join, if you see a person who's having a behavior problem, join the person in his or her reality by trying to see the world in his or her eyes. This is called validation therapy, not, a, not reality therapy where a person has a stroke and you try to re, re, bring them back to the real world, the date, the time, everything. This is looking at who they are at their time. Because remember, they have lost a lot of the memory. If Again, let me, just let me quickly go over this chart here again, because if you did not see some of this, then let me look at this again. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Okay. This is a memory chart that as you grow older, you, you, you gain memory. And as Alzheimer's begins to occur, you begin to lose the memory. The most current memories are lost first. And then you progress backwards and backwards and backwards. So the person who may be six years of age has Alzheimer's disease may actually be in their reality 30 years of age or 20 years of age. They, they, don't, they do not know anything above that age. 
So that, that's, that's pretty much lost. So you have to deal with them at that age. And if they're talking about the war, Second World War, you're talking about the Second World War. In essence, you, you are working, within, working with their reality. So that, that's why we say that talk to them, but talk to them in their reality. Okay, hang on. Understand, oops. Understanding a person's really context, reality context. Again, this is just emphasizing more what I said, that uh, who they are, what they are, when and how. how. When, I, when I work with people, faculty, uh, staff in nursing homes, one of the biggest things I like to do is take a picture of you know, the individual and put it up on, on, next, to their, uh, next to their room so they recognize who they are. They don't recognize who they are. If they're back in the 30s, that's who they are. They don't recognize that picture at all. You need to get a picture of them in the 30s and put that up. Again, that's the validation. Everything you have to deal is in their reality. Now, if somebody walks in who's the husband and they say, uh, hi, hi, sweetheart, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your husband. And the person look at, look at it and say, no, you're not. I have no idea who you are. And so therefore you say, well, who do you think I am? And he'll say, my, my sister or something. Then that's, who you, that's the reality you deal with. Never try to bring them back to the real world because they're, they're not there. That's, they don't have any memory about that. And also, if you're approaching a person, be calm, clear, slowly in your response and respectful. Because that, if, if they become confused and you are arguing with them, that will be a very serious problem. You also need to look at their physical needs late. Medication, medical issues. Are they, having, are they being moved? Do they have osteoarthritis that's causing the pain? Do they have bed sores? And medications. Medications are, are, are good, but also they're a double-edged sword. They can cause a lot of the symptoms, mimic a lot of the symptoms of dementia, and what they can do is exacerbate the dementia. They, may be, they have to look at hunger or thirst, lack of social interaction, pain. All of these will, will elicit a behavioral response. They may not be able to tell you they're hungry. They may not be able to tell you they're thirsty. We have found that individuals who have Alzheimer's disease and sort of the late uh, mid-stage and early, uh, early late stage, do not necessarily eat the time that we eat, the, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They will eat different times. So if you want them to eat, your best bet is to find out when they're hungry and have the food out for them to eat at that point in time. And same thing with pain. If they have uh, some kind of a pain going on, they're not gonna express it, but their behavior may elicit that response. So again, you have to be very observant on what's going on with them. Focus on a person's feelings, not facts, because the fact is you don't know what's really happening. You can only how what they're telling you or how their behavior is. Use the knowledge of a person's preference. This is, again, validation. Looking at the foods that they ate when they're 30 years of age, if they're hungry. Again, redirect the energy into a more soothing activity. The biggest thing that comes up with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, is they're very easy to redirect. If you're having an argument with them or they're focusing on something, change the conversation. Soothe it, move into a different conversation. In a short period of time, they will forget what they're talking about or what they're angry about. So again, not only the validation, but also redirection, very, very important in behavioral changes. Um, if, if you're going to try to develop a plan for these individuals, you have to go back and find out what's causing the behavior. Again, keeping the person in validation, not the reality, the reality where they are. And also you need, you need to, if you have other fa family members, they need also to be aware of the changes. Uh, I made a presentation last week and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the daughter was taking care of their mother. Uh, the sister came over and the sister was furious that uh, the daughter, who was basically the caregiver, was dealing with, 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 with validation. She kept on saying, no, no, you should be telling her the, today, what date today is, not talking about in the past. And that causes frustration between the sisters and also with the person who is there. So you have to be very, very careful of dealing with, with a lot of this situation. And again, validation therapy is very, very important. You have to find out what the problem is 
that causes behavior. And so uh, behavior is very important. Sundowner is another problem. This is something that becomes progressively worse. This is when the sun goes down and that the twilight stimulates the brain in a way that causes aggression, agitation, wandering, walking, and uh, actually becoming very confused. They're not quite sure what causes this. We all do know that towards the evening, we become tired, but something's happening with sundowner. Now, there are a lot of ways to approach this. One way is to make sure lights are on, draw the curtains so they can't see outside. Another one is to have them walk, talk to them, uh, give them some sugar, uh, some candy or something to eat. But keeping in mind too, that as these people progress in the later stages, they have a problem of swallowing. So you always need to be sure that they are uh, drinking a lot of fluids, especially when they're, when they're um, uh, eating food. And the food must be very, must be chopped up into small little pieces. So, so, that, so that they can um, uh, swallow well with, with, without having some serious problems. So sundowning is a problem. Nursing homes have a real big problem with this because of wandering. That's why they have in, uh, enclosed uh, yards or enclosed rooms where the person can just walk and walk and walk. Um, make sure, of course, the area is secure so they can't get out. But wandering is an issue. And it's basically, a lot of the agitation is occurring, of course, at sundown. Uh, one of the biggest confusions when I talked to very, when I talked very early at the beginning of the presentation, that confusion is a big problem because again, it's like a brain's like a computer. Input comes in. If they cannot process it, it becomes confusing, and the processing is slowed down, and the connections are gone. So if a person does not recognize where they're at. I mean, they could, just, they could live in a home all their lives. And when they walk outside, and they'll become very confused. They don't recognize the landmarks that we use to know where we are, where we're going, and when to return. So we need to make sure that they don't get out. They don't wander by themselves. Because, because the input coming in is not going to be processed properly. And also, if, if, there are, if they, again, I mentioned validation, do not argue with them, reorient them to something else, another conversation. If they become paranoid, talk about what's going on. And if they say somebody's stealing it, well, don't disagree with them. Say, well, okay, what can we do to, to, uh, to, to stop the, the theft? So again, validation is important. Very, very important. Aggressive behavior. This is a big problem for family members because if the person never had aggressive behavior, suddenly they're becoming aggressive. You need to find a trigger and redirect it. Um, they can, out of the blue, start becoming angry. Uh, could be, it could be many things. You always need to find a trigger as much as possible. Talk to them. Ask them, you know, what is the problem? And seeing if they're, if they're willing to talk about it. But again, uh, validation, recognizing the, 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 the trigger for the problem, Two of them are very important in observation, observation of behavior. You find, you, you see if you can find any, any kind of trigger that seems to be happening every time with that behavior. Because with, remember, these people are late onset. They are late behavior. They're not going to be able to verbalize what they see or feel. All you can do is let's say, find out that they are behaving improperly. If that behaving improperly is is a, a causing problems of disruption, you have to find out what's going on. And finding out what's going on is very tricky, very hard, but you have to see if there's kind of any commonality between the behavior and a trigger. Again, redirect. It's always, it's always easy to redirect because the short-term memory is, is, is pretty much minim, minimum now and very easy for them to uh, forget what they were doing or what causes agitation. Aggression, again, something we talked about, usually aggressive behaviors associated with dementia and upsetting, but are not dangerous. Well, some of them are dangerous. Some of them can be very violent behavior response. So you have to be very careful. Uh, occasionally the person's in danger themselves or others, 
and safety measures are necessary. Keep knives out of the out of the way and all, all that. Speak with a doctor about medication interventions. Be very careful with this because sometimes the doctor will want to prescribe an antipsychotic medication, and a lot of the adverse drug reactions of antipsychotic antipsychotic medications will will increase increase and exacerbate the dementia. So you want to be careful that the doctor is not prescribing something that's going to cause more serious a problem. If they start taking the medication and it doesn't improve, but actually exacerbates and becomes worse, you need to contact the doctor to have the doctor help you figure out what is going on and try to either reduce the dose or give another medication. Medications are a double-edged sword. They are good, but they can also cause real problems. Sometimes you have to call 911. This can be a problem, especially if the 911 response is not trained how to deal with, with a person who's, who's, act, uh, who's active, uh, acting out. We've seen this occur occasionally when a police comes to a house where a person has a mental health problem, the police do not know how to respond and you have serious confrontation. Same thing happens here. You have to tell if you're gonna call somebody or if you're gonna take them to the hospital or you're gonna take them someplace because they have a real serious mental health outbreak. You need to tell them that they have Alzheimer's disease and the, the behaviors you're seeing are associated with something going on so that, so that they they'll realize and understand that and try to figure out what to do. But again, behavior is a problem, big problem. Repetition, this drives people crazy. They keep repeating themselves, repeating themselves, repeating themselves, the same story every 10 minutes or every five minutes. Again, that's the problem with that is that it seems that, that they're stuck in that reality. They're stuck in that time. Uh, again, they're not too sure what the repetition is all about, what's causing that. Is it the insecurity and they're repeating something because they understand what that is, they feel comfortable with it, and they don't want to move on to something that they may feel uncomfortable. But what happens here, uh, some of the research has shown, is by redirecting them again. Redirecting is just as important as validation and observations. Redirect them, talk to them, move on to another subject that they feel comfortable with. Again, the validation is if they're back in their 20s, talk about something that's going on in their 20s, that's where their, that's where their memory's at, that's where the reality is at, and maybe they'll, they'll stop the repetition. Again, what, is, what you're doing is you're redirecting them to a time in their life or their reality, which is very, very important. 60% of the people with dementia will wander. It's probably higher. And it can happen on any stage without warning. Now, older individuals with the late onset dementia behaviors, a lot of times they may not be physically able to walk or wander. It doesn't necessarily mean they, they don't. As I said before, you can have a person just walking outside and they got totally lost even though it's a very familiar neighborhood because they don't recognize the landmarks. Now, some states have gone and, and putting on um, wristbands of who they are and a phone number. So if they do uh, wander, that they can be very easily identified as to who they are and make, make, make an appropriate phone call. But wandering is an issue. Now, at nighttime, again, it's not, a, not as big of a problem with this, with this late onset, but at nighttime, when you're sleeping, they may be up because their biorhythms are gone. I mean, they, for them, nighttime is day and, some, and day is night. So they may be waking up in the nighttime while you're sleeping. So you have to figure out ways to stop them from leaving the house. That may need, mean complex, a lock that may have, may have a code put into it or, or uh, 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 a, a lock that... that you need to have a key or one of those have a chain lock. You need something that's keeping them from getting outside. You also need to have also uh, make sure there are no dangerous rugs out so they can trip and fall and hurt themselves. No danger, no dangerous knives or anything else when they're walking. Also, you may want to put water bottles outside, uh, water bottles on the table when they're walking, or you may want to put some candy or something because again, their meal time is different than your meal time. Their meal time is when they feel hungry, not necessarily putting on a schedule because schedules are gone. They just don't remember a schedule. So that's, that's very important. 
the Alzheimer's Association, uh, there are things that, that uh, you can help. You have Alzheimer's navigators who, you, who will help you find, a fa help family members find a uh, service, a health service or a social service. Uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's navigators are becoming very, very important. We found, especially in Florida, that many private organizations or private individuals who are nurses will advertise themselves as a navigator where a family member will contract them and they will work with that family to figure out what services they need as the changes occur or what, 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 what's the next step. Do they need residential care? Do they, do they need a nursing home or whatever? So navigators are important and there's a piece of legislation now in Washington that actually there's a bill that will actually provide money for families to hire a navigator to figure out what services they need. And there's money that will allocate to the family as to purchase these services that are not covered by Medicaid and Medicare. So that's a new bill. If that, be if that becomes law, that will be very, very important because it'll help families be able to navigate. But navigation is a very important. They need help. They also need to know what the community resources are there. Uh, again, uh, there are a lot of community resources that are unknown to these individuals. You can call the Alzheimer's Association or the Department of Aging. They should be able to help. Again, these are different ways of finding information. And of course, you have the Alzheimer's Association <clears throat> that support, support groups that are helpful in education programs like we see today dealing with those individuals. And there's your, help, uh, your Alzheimer's help, help line helping people. Again, this is the Alzheimer's Association number, the 800-272-3900. I think that for the PowerPoint, that ends the PowerPoint. What I want to do is go back to the slides that uh, I had up before and that they weren't showing for some reasons. So I want to go back to those this is a summaries. Um, this is, the, this is what, what I was talking about before, the definition of, of dementia. As I said before, there's, only 30 some, there's over 30 some different forms of dementia. They're broken down into three, acute, the uh, Remember the uh, MCI. Ron, sorry to, to interrupt. Yep. This is Chris. Um, we're, I think we're only seeing a portion of that slide. Oh. Is there a way to uh, fully expand it? Uh, what portion is it missing? It, we can see the top and then it cuts off. Okay, the top's important. The, the state, uh, the impairment in memory and uh, behavioral, you see that in change of personality? So I, we can only see a purple rectangle. Oh. Yeah, right. so we seem to have problems with that. Okay, well, let me get rid of that one. And oh, wait a minute. Let, let me hang on. I think I have it's, it's because I have two on here. Okay. I think that will be helpful. Can you see that now? Uh, not yet. No. Okay. Let me pull it up again. Hang on. Share a slide. Oh, I think we now? have. Uh, I think How we have now? the the wrong screen there. How about now? Uh, now we're seeing the screen with your folders. So if uh, this was uh, similar to the earlier issue, if you could um, close out and switch the screen that you're sharing. Okay. So I think you have two screens up, correct? Yeah, no, I have only one screen up. How about now? Uh, no, sir. Uh, I think I lost it because I don't. I don't see the PowerPoint on there anymore. I don't see the the. Uh, well, it's uh, you were able to correct this earlier. Um, yeah. When you when you got out of share screen, stop. And then screen. there we go. Stop screen. Selected share screen again, and then yeah. selected the screen that had the PowerPoint on it. Okay, hang on. Share screen. How about now? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I love technology. Um, again, these are the three factors that determine a dementia. And depending upon uh, which of these will define the dementia. Some dementias have all of them, like Alzheimer's disease, 
Some dementias have, have, have only some of these like dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, but it is impaired memory and again, cognitive ability and change in personality. Okay, let me quickly go to, now, Chris, can you see this one? Ron, I think uh, you, you closed out. So uh, if you repeat what you what you did- Share screen um, again, okay. A second ago, um, okay. I think we'll be uh, on the right track. Okay. Uh, it's the, the other screen. You want the other screen? The screen? Uh, the, the screen that we're seeing now is the file screen. So you'll want to switch. Uh, you had you had it up just a while ago. You just you closed out of it uh, accidentally. Okay. Stop sharing. Let's do this. And let's do. That's that's the one we see the one now that says dementia criteria. Okay. Now again, uh, behavior is an issue. Uh, as I said before, we talked about all of these behaviors, and again, there are triggers for these behaviors. There's a reason why it's occurring, and if a behavior is occurring, it becomes a serious problem. Deflect, 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 deflect. Change the subject. The cognition, again, memory. Uh, older, the older individual with the late onset, the memory is pretty much gone. It has it has been it has regressed all the way back. To eight to an age that they are they are earlier on, and then you need to find that at that age. And that's you play the music, the food, the conversation. You don't try to bring them up to where they are today. It's not going to work. Higher executive functioning, the late onset, they're all gone. You cannot you cannot have these individuals really do anything that's complex. As they grow older, you need to keep life simple. You need to keep their structure simple. Do not do not cause things that are confusing. If you, if you have the radio on, the TV on, there's a lot of activity going around. The brain cannot process that. You have to keep it simple. Only, only the radio or the TV. You have to keep the conversation simple. You talk to the person, not in complex sentences. You talk to them in statements. Sit down, dinner, whatever. So again, keeping in mind, you have to keep their life simple. <coughs> As they progress, this becomes more and more complex. And if, you, if it becomes too confusing and they cannot figure out what's going on, there's gonna be a behavioral issue. Again, a, a judgment, don't expect them to make good judgment. They're not gonna be able to do that. That is gone. Uh, not only because of the cognition, but what judgment has been learned. So again, uh, expect them not to make good judgment, make sure if they're gonna go outside that they're dressed appropriately. Again, they're, gonna, they're not gonna know people, they're not gonna know time, they're not gonna know location that the spatial orientation abilities are pretty much diminished. Their memories are back now. Maybe when they got married, they're, past, they're, they're, they're beyond, uh, they're, before they got married, they don't remember them being married at all. They don't remember the wife. They don't remember the children. They don't remember the grandchildren. Do not be frustrated by trying to tell them, this is your wife, this is your wife, this is your grandchildren. The memory is not there. Ask them who the person is and you talk to them at that point in time. And language, again, they're going to start just using phrases or simple words. And really, towards the end, there will not be any, any type of conversation whatsoever. Okay, let's go back to another. Hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, Hang with us uh, a few more minutes, yep, uh, and, right. folks, and, and we have a, a question. Um, so we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, let me, one last slide here. Okay, can you see this? We see late stage symptoms. Yes, that's it. Again, this is basically summarizing everything we just talked about. They are the world of sense, they experience the word through sense, world through senses, not necessarily that we think of. Their hearing and vision is there, but the information coming in cannot be processed. Touch, touch, touch is very important to these people. Let them see you. Uh, the impaired in memory increases. Again, this is 
the memory, not necessarily new skills. You cannot teach them new skills at the stage, but they just forget that they forgot. They'll say something and a minute later, they will not remember what they forgot. That part of the brain has pretty much lost all connection. Language becomes very basic. They will may, 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 they may say words that are, that are not appropriate. Again, you need to ask them what they're talking about. You need to expand the conversation or redirect the conversation. And continence, of course, goes without saying. Dependence on the caregiver. Now, this is something that uh, caregivers have been trained to mimic. Do things that the person can follow. If you want the person to brush your their teeth, you mimic and they will follow it. Don't ask them to brush their teeth because they may have forgotten how to do that. So a lot of times you may have to be the model that they follow day in and day out. That they brush your teeth today, they're not going to remember tomorrow. So you have to do it all over again. And the physical abilities really diminish quite a lot. So I think that pretty much uh, takes care of what I want to talk about. Um, let's uh, open up the questions then. Certainly, uh, Ron. And uh, if you want to unmute uh, your video, um, we can see you. Uh, so I, we go. We have what I, yes, yes. Uh, we have actually what I think is a very good question coming from the perspective of professional caregiving. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, understanding a person's past is crucial, but in long-term care, a person's past is often not known or accessible. What do we do if we don't know their preferences on biography? Yeah. That is a question that we deal a lot with, with nursing homes when we, when we do the training. And this is where you need to look at the caregiver. You need to look at the family members. You need to talk to the family members. You need to find out where they, what, what is their history? And going, uh, this is going back, were they in the war, were they at sports, whatever the case may be, you need to talk to the family members. That becomes very, very important. And you need to ask them to bring in pictures or to bring in other artifacts that were, that were part of their past. Again, you're absolutely right. They're in a home, it's 2021, they're back in 1940 or 1950 or 1960. And that's what you need. You need, you need to build up the biography basically based upon input from the family. And again, said before, bringing in artifacts. Very important, very critical. And I think you will do, reduce a lot of the frustration, a lot of, of the anger, because the, these people, remember, are in an environment they're not familiar with. They just don't know where they're at because that's not their reality. And you need to bring them to that, their, their reality, to the validation. Make their area who they were at that time. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up, um, uh, uh, you know, with respect to your answer, I think is um, a, a lot of people, um, I think meaning healthcare professionals, a lot of people do not have access uh, or do not have family to access. I'm sorry. I think it's just in general. A lot of people do not have family to access. Mm -hmm. For instance, if, considering this may be an, an, an aging person, they may no longer have family members that could be interviewed about their past. Mm -hmm. that, again, a, again, a, a very good question. And this is where it becomes very difficult. You start talking to the person. And you kind of figure out what their age is and you kind of subtract going backwards and trying to figure out where they might have been like, were they in the war? Were you in the sports? Did you travel? Trying to ask questions that they may, it may trigger a memory of that past. In that case, you have to talk to the individual. Now, if the person has a very severe dementia, uh, they may not be able to communicate very well. They just may not be able to tell you uh, what the information is. But again, the important thing is you talk to them at the very beginning when they come in because they're not oriented <coughs> to a whole new environment. So by talking to them and try to talk to them about their past, that may help them feel comfortable and you're gaining information. Very good. Thank you, Ron. We have another question. <coughs> Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, this question is, what about working with people with dementia who are partially blind and very hard of hearing or wear hearing aids. Um, what would you suggest for a situation like that? Well, that's a, that's <laughs> again, um, depends upon if, they, if they're having a hearing aid, <clears throat> that could be a problem <clears throat> because 
the hearing aid is going to pick up a lot of noise, background noise. And the background noise itself coming in, keeping in mind that brain is a limited com computer, that background noise coming in can cause confusion. So the point is, is that that, that back, background noise such, because I know, I know ear, uh, hearing aids can be, can be today uh, modified to just bring in certain noises. But uh, if, it, if the hearing aid itself is causing problems, I mean, you have a person who's in late stage dementia has a hearing aid, they're hearing voices. So far as they're concerned, that's hallucination. They have no idea who that person is or what's going on. All they hear is, a, is, a, is the voice in their head. So hearing aids for late dementia can really exacerbate it by giving them auditory hallucinations, which are not really there. And if they're blind, that really becomes a real, a real big problem because how to deal with individuals who are blind. Again, you talk to them, you describe the environment, you have them touch things. Um, actually, some I don't I, if, they, if they are always blind, then they may know Braille, but, uh, but again, because of a lot, mm -hmm. loss of cognition, they may not understand the Braille. Blindness can be a real serious problem. And the only thing you can do is talk to them, tell them what's in the environment, what's around them, what they're doing, what's happening because they can't, they can't see and they may not know what's happening. So don't do things quick, do things quietly and always explain to them what is happening and touch, touch, touch. But again, the hearing aid could cause audio, audio hallucinations, blindness, you just need to comfort them and letting them know what's happening around them. I mean, if you want to just close your eyes, put a blindfold on and, and, and walk around, you'll find out that a lot of noises are just going on you don't know what's happening can cause confusion. You need, do not do anything unless you talk to the person and let them know what you're doing. Very good. Thank you so much, Ron. We are at time, but um, there is a comment that I'm going to read from the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, regarding the question that you just answered. Um, it's a very good question. The more we hang out with them and do activities, the more we learn about them. Mm -hmm. For example, as we played games with one person, we learned they play in a particular sport. Yep. They now love playing sport via a video game. Mm -hmm. That game has now brought back pleasant, old pleasant memories for that person. Yes. Very yes. interesting, and yes. we are at time. Yes, that that the, the, the again before validation, find out who they are, where they were, what time they're in, and that's what you play to. Okay, very good. Thank you all for attending, and just want to remind you that the next presentation is our closing session. Everyone's invited at two fifteen for the joy of dementia caregiving with Cindy Brown. Thank you, Ron. And I, and I quickly apologize for my my uh, my technological in incompetence here. <laughs> it's uh, technology. It's uh, something we're all dealing with. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.